it's funny how in the long-term rental side in, in my real estate company, you know, people come in and they think they've got to buy all these properties. You know, just a few properties can make a huge difference in your life. <laughs> It is my pleasure to welcome Rachel Gainsbrew, and she is a specialist in luxury real estate investing, short-term rentals for busy professionals. And she's got some incredible properties and is doing really well with them. She has a, I think a TV deal on the way, but can't say much about it yet. <laughs> I think I'll leave it up to her. Rachel, welcome. How are you? Hi, Jason. Oh my goodness. I'm such a huge fan. Thank you so much for having me here today. I am so grateful for all the information and the content that you put out on a weekly basis that has helped many of us real estate investors. So thank you. What an honor. Well, thank you. And thanks for being here. And I, I appreciate that. So Rachel, you have developed a, a really nice portfolio of luxury properties, Airbnb properties, and it looks like you're buying them almost always, right? I think maybe you have a couple rentals in your portfolio that you're doing the, the what they call the rental arbitrage model, right? Correct. Yeah. So oh. purchasing is my bread and butter. I am a buy and hold type of girl. Mm -hmm. And so anything that I would do outside of that, the purpose is to, to create a cash flow or generate some revenue to then purchase. So I do have a, a couple in the portfolio that are rental arbitrage where I lease them, I rent them. And uh, because of the spread, I can then utilize that uh, revenue, the net off of the top after rent is paid and after expenses to then go beef up the savings for that next down payment to purchase. And the third strategy, of course, is a it's kind of like a property management strategy, but since I'm not a realtor, it's more so of a co-hosting strategy where I partner with other investors who have properties that they set up as luxury short-term rentals or need help setting up that way. And since I have the systems in place, I can manage the burdensome guest communication, the cleaning team, and all of that. So we have a couple of, we have a few those as well uh, that we utilize as uh, co-host properties. And again, the spread goes towards beefing up that savings to grab some more properties uh, for ownership. That's excellent. And when you do that co-hosting arrangement, yeah. does that owner not need a property manager? They can just simply co-host directly with you. Is that how that works? Well, you got to think about the role of a traditional property manager when it comes to a long-term landlord situation. So a lot of times the property manager's uh, level of effort uh, for long-term is not going to be the same as short-term, right? Right. So those individuals, they will not find those individuals uh, fairly quickly. Uh, typically, they would have to go and reach out to one of those big box companies that right. do the vacation rentals. Like and those are. Yes, exactly. Right. Exactly. And say they want something a little bit more uh, custom, something a little bit more a la carte, where, you know, you you can connect with them on a different level and they don't feel like they're necessarily a number. Uh, so they come to us and it's not necessarily we do a lot of marketing or we're trying to generate leads that way. It's typically friends and family, those in our real estate ecosystem who say, hey, you know what, I'd, I'd rather work with you. I trust you. Uh, and that's how that relationship is formed, really. But they certainly can go to a Vacasa or an Evolve or one of those big companies as well. Right. But what I'm saying is, and, you know, I have not been totally impressed with property managers over the years of any type, short term, long term, anything. <laughs> so I really like the idea of self managing properties. Okay. And the software and the technology really enable it nowadays. So are you self managing all your properties? Absolutely. Absolutely. And so I just train, you know, cleaners, I train my communications team and I self-manage. Yes. Okay. And so when people do the co-hosting arrangement with you, they can self-manage with you. You're, you're managing, they're managing, no, no manager needed. That's, that's what I was getting at, right? Absolutely. Yes. Right. Mm -hmm. And talk to us about geography because you're self-managing these short-term rental properties remotely, right? 
Yeah, absolutely. And so when it comes to short-term rentals, you have to be mindful of the environment of where the property is located. So uh, a portion of our properties are located in a destination vacation rental area, but another portion are located in suburban areas where there are homes and, you know, full-time residents as well. And so those properties in particular, you want to make sure you have the technology in place to do like very close monitoring of those Mm -hmm. properties. Okay. So for instance, you want to have technology such as a, a party squasher, a noise aware, just to make sure that the noise levels aren't out of control. And you probably want that for your vacation areas as well, because you do not want a huge rager or anything like that happening. Right, those right. Properties. Um, now I'm familiar with noise aware. I have that mm-hmm. in one of my properties. What is party squasher? Is that different than noise aware or is it the same idea? It's a similar idea, but a little bit different. And I'm sure noise, noise aware may have technology to do this as well. So party squasher will identify the number of technology tools that are in the property. Say a whole family gets there. There are 10 uh, items that jump onto the Wi-Fi. Mm-hmm. Next thing you know, there's a hundred onto the Wi-Fi. Right. But, will... but those other, those other like party guests wouldn't necessarily join your Wi-Fi from their cell phone. Right. And not necessarily the Wi-Fi, but it can detect uh, other items that have Wi-Fi oh. or some type of uh, technology or internet that's entering the property. So okay, it was, so it, it's it almost just like a ticker. The, the signal, the signal uh, yes. it knows that there's a phone in there. Yes. It doesn't connect with it. That's yeah. scary. <laughs> no, 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 it doesn't connect with it. It identifies there. There's an there's an increased number of signals in that property, and if it's out of control, then you can identify quickly. Okay. I would expect maybe five more if someone's jumping on an iPad, but if it's tens but, of twenties more, then... but, but it doesn't do anything, right? It, it just alerts you and then you have to call and tell them to stop, right? Yes. The party squasher, that's, that's what it does. I believe the noise aware though, we have that set up to alert the guests that okay. you're, you know, there's a whole escalation plan with that. Okay. Okay, good. Sounds great. So tell us about the geography you're covering with your properties and and maybe start at the beginning. Like what's the first one you bought? Where was that? You live in the Atlanta, Georgia area yes. and mm-hmm. you've got stuff in Florida, way up to the Poconos. I yeah. mean, where else, where do you have properties and where do you start? Sure. I started in my own backyard in Georgia. So um, I looked around at all the investment strategies, honestly, as a healthcare professional, I was looking for a way to generate revenue outside of healthcare. And so real estate was it. Went to Alabama to look at, you know, a little rundown home. I just decided at that point, you know what, I'm most likely going to be in the We Buy Pretty Homes community (laughs) instead of the We Buy Ugly Homes. I just didn't have the bandwidth nor the skill set to do fix and flip, although I watched a lot of HDTV and I thought I did, but I did not. So I went and found something pretty turnkey and needed a little bit of help. It was walking distance from my home in a you know, in suburban area, a little bit cost, higher cost of living area. And this particular property uh, needed a roof. Uh, it was selling for a hundred thousand dollars under uh, what I thought uh, the market value should be because the homeowner had passed away and the trustee lived out of state. And I came in, I was bid number seven. I asked for nothing and I won the bid while the other investors, you know, they asked for a lot of contingencies. And so I ended up winning that bid. And so I started off there, beautiful home, great schools in the area, great neighborhood, great curb appeal. And uh, having studied and considered consumed a lot of real estate content uh, the prior year, I knew exactly what I needed to do in order to set it up as a luxury short-term rental, because that's where I saw the biggest spread is just niching into the luxury and not competing in the red ocean with everyone else. I had to kind of set myself apart so that I can kind of peacock above the fray. Right. In that blue ocean strategy as the book is, yeah, we all know the book. And how much was that property, that first one? $290,000. Oh, but it wasn't expensive. That's an inexpensive property. What year is this, by the way? 2019. Oh, so yeah. Okay. So now it's worth double, but yeah, <laughs> it, it is yeah. actually, it is. Yes. Yeah. It, it's been three years, so it must be worth double, right? <laughs> it's a ridiculous it's market insane. we're in, but okay. But then you levered up to some really expensive properties, right? Yeah. So the next property, and I can show it to you real quick. Let me go ahead and share that. The right. next property was one um, in that neighborhood as well. So for those of you listening to audio only and not on the YouTube channel, Rachel's sharing her screen and we're looking at a beautiful property on Airbnb, spacious, secluded, newly listed luxury retreat. And right now it's $761 per night 
what's been the high on this property per night or what do you anticipate it to be i guess yeah so so the highest it's been and let me tell you a little story about this property i just wanted to go through this so when we first listed this property we actually turned on a, a dynamic pricing tool. This is a six bedroom, four bathroom. And so we turned on a dynamic pricing tool. How many square feet, by the way? This is 4,500 square feet or so. Got it. So it's a, it's a big home and your dynamic pricing tool. If you want to share that screen again, feel free. To, I didn't mean to interrupt it. No, no, that's okay. Yeah. So I, I, I did want to tell the story. So I'll, I'll just, I'll just tell you that. And then I'll share it in a moment. Okay. So with the dynamic pricing tool, uh, Jason, you know, I, I don't know if you know my background, I'm a little girl from Haiti, you know, so very frugal. Uh, I was thinking to myself, this is a home that was renting out as a long-term rental for $1,800 a month. And I thought to myself, if I can rent it out as a short-term rental, design it really nicely, um, get about, you know, $8,000 a month, that would be fantastic was my initial mindset. Once I turned on the dynamic pricing tool and there's AI in that tool, the one that I use is called Price Labs. And so the AI in that tool, I expect to train it to take some time to get it familiarized with the property in the area. Uh, but immediately it shot out for a 30 night stay, $28,000 for that first month. And this was in 2019. So 28K. And I thought to myself, no, that's ridiculous. This is a suburban area. This is not a destination. This is just homes and families, but it was a little bit secluded on a couple of acres. Well, it got booked that night for $28,000. The following month, it was booked for 15 k But tell us how many nights booking that is, just so we understand. Sure. $28,000 for 30 nights. Okay. So on that particular property. Wow. Okay. So let's just get this straight. Yes. So this is a property that used to rent for, on a, it's a long-term rental for $1,800 a month. Correct. Yes. You converted it to a short-term rental. Yes. How much did the house cost? $462,000. Where is it? Peachtree City, Georgia, suburban area. In, right. in... I know it. Yeah. Okay. okay. <laughs> and, and so how much did you spend to improve the property after that? Thirty-two, thirty-one, thirty-two thousand $32,000. Did that so include all the furniture and stuff or was that just like capital improvements to the house? Everything. Wow. Okay. So you're four ninety dollars into this deal. Yes that used to rent for 1800 a month long-term rental. And the first month you rent it for $28,000 as a short-term rental? Yes. Okay, Rachel, <laughs> I have to do something. We have a special sound effect for you. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I love that. Congratulations. I uh, love that. And then the second rental booking on that was how much and for how long? Okay. So initially my, my plans are, and my model really, Jason is to rent two night minimum stays, but I was ramping up a new cleaning team and I needed to train them. So I, I just placed it for 30 night minimums just to ramp them up. I thought maybe one month or two months, I would just do 30 night minimums for mm -hmm. those two months until, you know, my team was in, in place. Okay. So the, so it stayed at the 30 uh, night minimum. The next month it rented for 15 K the next month for 21 K and then the next month for 22 K. Okay. And wow. That's phenomenal. Congratulations. So what do you attribute the rather amazing success of that to? And I do want to make sure I ask you another question. And that is, do you ever have properties that have HOAs or are they all no HOA areas? So that's a great question. And I'll let you know my caveat. I do. I, I feel very strongly about HOAs and I will let you know my opinion. In, in which that. direction? <laughs> it's a non no HOA. Yeah, no HOA. I would say 99% of the time, but I do have two caveats for HOAs. Okay. So what I attributed it to was that was a time period really where uh, the thirst for travel was there. Uh, the property is well positioned in a great neighborhood. And I stumbled upon a new guest avatar. So my original guest avatar was multi-generational, multi-families traveling with pets, children, and, you know, young children and teens. And what I love about that avatar is when I'm traveling with my parents and my mom and dad, my husband, his parents, my uh, siblings, their spouses, my husband, siblings, and their spouses. Well, you have about four or five paying family groups. <laughs> right. And even if we were to to rent the property, the, this property rents anywhere from 700, 800 a night to 2,800 a night. So if 
depending on the season. So if we were to rent it out and, and these family groups can split that nightly rate essentially for seven nights or so, you know, one family unit is paying about a thousand to $2,000, which isn't bad for a six bedroom mm-hmm. home yeah. for seven nights. So that's why I love that guest avatar. But since there's a lot of filming in the area, a lot of executive producers, you know, that guest avatar does gravitate towards our properties. And additionally, we stumbled upon uh, the insurance guests. So for instance, if a guest's home has burnt down, unfortunately, in the surrounding area, and they're used to a, a standard of living, well, our homes meet uh, that criteria. So all state insurance and state farm insurance, they're constantly reaching out to us. And those nightly stays are, they think it's going to be 30 days, but we know with renovations, those are three, six, nine month uh, timelines. So we've had guests who checked in for one month, they're with us for a year paying a premium, which is incredible. That is, that is phenomenal. Okay. So Georgia uh, nearby close to home was your first area. And then what did you do? Then I started to look around at that point. I realized, wow, I really like this. I want to do more of this. And so I joined masterminds and groups and started to collaborate with other realtors and so not realtors, rather real estate investors. And um, I determined there was a lot of opportunity in the Poconos uh, area through some of those collaborations. And you can purchase a home at in 2019, 2020 for, you know, $200,000. And these are five or six bedroom homes. And my focus is five to eight bedrooms. That is my bread and butter. Again, I'm looking to serve a larger family unit that can split that nightly rate, that larger nightly rate. And so we were able to find some for 175K in the Poconos, 225K in the Poconos, partnered on a couple of deals uh, there as well, and launched those as short-term rentals. And those rent out anywhere from 700 a night to 2,500 a night. And our guests are coming from New York. They're coming from Connecticut. They're coming from Pennsylvania. It's in Pennsylvania, obviously in New Jersey. So that's, uh, that's where they're coming from. And and I, I believe over, I think $7 billion worth of dollars were spent in travel in the Poconos area right. uh, last year. So a yeah. lot of visitors and they all need some places. What, what are those homes worth now though, to give people a proper perspective of that rent to value ratio? You know, if you bought it for 175 or 200 or 250, what's it worth now? At the lowest, 500, 500 K Okay. at the lowest, but I would say around six to 700 K is going to be the median. Oh, wow, that's amazing. And so that $700,000 house that you own rents for how much in you know your average monthly income, because this is all very seasonal. So you have to adjust and kind of average that out, of course. But But just tell us about that, if you would. What's great about the Poconos is there's ski and then there's fishing, there are lakes. There's so we have about two months where the seasonality, we really get hit. And those months are the months we take time to make all of the capital improvements in the property, pressure wash, deep clean. So on an annual basis, anywhere from 190 to 280 annually is what we make on those properties. That's the top of line. No, no, no. Top of line, one ninety to two hundred thousand oh, ninety thousand dollars. Yes, okay. one hundred ninety thousand to two hundred and eighty thousand. And what do you net out of that? I would net about seventy. I would say sixty five percent to be con- conservative. Sixty five percent of that is what we net. Sixty five percent will be your net before debt service, though, or probably property taxes and insurance and so forth, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. So that's like an NOI type of number. Got it. Okay, Mm -hmm. great. And then what about Florida? You have properties in Florida too, right? Yeah, we're actually starting in Florida. So we have a new construction on Rosemary Beach. We found a sweet lot of I love Rosemary Beach and Alice Beach right next door. I love those two. Those are great. Can you believe we found a lot of land? It is not tier one. I will say it's like more like tier four, but we found a lot of land and we're building there. And so although I'm anti-HOA, Jason, I will say my two caveats on HOA is this. 
I'm okay with an HOA only if the HOA is a part of a resort community where it's obvious that you're paying towards um, great amenities and you're sharing those costs. And number two, more than 50% of the properties within that HOA must be a short-term rental in order for me to go in to a community with the HOA. Those are my rules of thumb. So to it has know to be- that the, To know that the HOA is friendly to it. Mm-hmm. To know that I'm willing to invest <laughs> there. Right. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Otherwise, I, I just walk away from HOAs because who have been there, done that. And that's a that's definitely a story. <laughs> yeah, right. Right. Yeah. The HOAs can be very difficult, obviously. OK, what absolutely. else do you want people to know? Yeah. So I want people to know really less is more. You know, and when you are taking down one property or two properties, you have that opportunity to set it up and design it in a way that is going to speak to your guests. And when it comes to luxury, it is not only about the accumulation of things, the accumulation of gold doorknobs. It's all really about the experience. The luxury travel guest is wanting you to curate for them an experience that is authentic and that is unique. And so we're always looking for ways to drive that home because it's, it's, really important. And it's really what's going to allow you to live in the blue ocean and and not in the red ocean with everyone else doing what everyone else is doing. So one or two properties, especially for my healthcare friends, healthcare professional friends who are looking to get out of that grind, one or two properties could help you to be wildly successful. Yeah, that can make all the difference. How many do you have in your portfolio now? We own seven, but we have a total of 18 that, you know, we manage for others and we're renting a few. So we okay, actually so, own seven ourselves. So 18 and you manage some co-management and then yes. some you rental Three. arbitrage, right? Yes. Okay. Yep. Got mm-hmm. it. Got it. Good. Yeah. Okay. It's funny how in the long-term rental side in, in my real estate company, you know, people come in and they think they've got to buy all these properties, you know, just a few properties can make a huge difference in your life. <laughs> it's, it's, you know. But yep. hey, the more the more the merrier too, right? Right, so, right. Yeah. absolutely. Okay, good. Do you want to show us some of those uh, revenue numbers and things like that? Share your screen again. Yeah, sure, absolutely. And and what can you tell us about your TV deal? I mean, I know you can't say too much, right? Yes. So you know what? And I, I just shared my screen, and this one popped up again. So this is a property. This is the property that was actually on the TV deal. So I can say that, and that's it. But it is a property that uh, Air DNA and which is a tool that we use to um, identify and uh, check out markets. But that particular tool, uh, they reach out to us to ask us to be on a TV show about short-term rentals, and mm-hmm. it's a show on investments. So definitely, definitely excited about that. This is a newer property. And if you can see that, let me zoom in a little bit without showing too much of the private information. So this is a property here that is booked for three nights. This is a larger property, our 16 bedroom, booked for three nights in July for 28,296. So this is a larger property. This particular booking is a corporate booking. So we do have a company coming in to do a team building activity. So really excited about that. And this one is actually in the Poconos as well. Uh, Mm -hmm. This is another one in August. And we have a few, this one here is coming up in uh, end of the month as well. Mm -hmm. Okay. I meant to ask you, I'm surprised that you're building from scratch ground up. And when you said you had a lot of land, you meant one lot, right? Correct. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. Yeah. So don't the construction costs just make that deal very hard to make it make sense because the resale properties you purchased, you know, those, those numbers were pretty good. What do you think? I agree with you. And if anyone would show up and ask me about building new construction, I would say no to it. But Jason, this is Rosemary Beach. Yeah. Think about it. And we bought that lot of land for $99,000 in Rosemary Beach. Rosemary Beach. How how much will that project be when you finish though? What's your construction cost? 653 total. How many square feet? 3,800 square feet. That's pretty good. Yeah, five bedrooms, uh, four of which are in the main house, and then we have a carriage house as well. Mm-hmm. And uh, the neighbor, uh, similar floor plan, just sold for 1.6. Wow, fantastic. You're getting some good deals. What else do you want people to know about, like other tools that you use, software, you know, any evaluation criteria, you know, what market you should go into? 
I think maybe the two hardest, uh, hottest, I should say, short-term rental markets in the country are certainly Nashville's been like the bachelorette party capital of the country. I don't yeah. know if that's still the case. Scottsdale, Arizona, really hot market. But I'm sort of wondering if, you know, they have been hot and maybe they, they've kind of run their course. I, I don't know. You know, what do you think? I, I mean, are you just looking at ARDNA? They've been on the show before and looking at their numbers or, or how do you evaluate a market? Yeah, that's a great question. So what excites me with a market is going to be really a 30% or higher cash on cash return. Uh, I was getting 40, 50, 60% cash on cash back in the day. I feel like those days are long ago, but they were last year and the year prior. So a 30% cash on cash return is something that excites me. So I'm looking in areas that are secondary markets to the big areas. I know with the Smokies, everyone loves the Smokies, Nashville, but I feel as though the the spread on those are too thin. So you go in there and you're purchasing for 1.5 million and then you're making 70 or 80 K not bad, but the spread on that is too thin for my appetite. So mm-hmm. I would rather go to the outskirts, you know, say Blue Ridge, Georgia, the outskirts, you know, Mineral Bluff or Cherry Log, not Morganton, those areas that aren't spoken of the most, mm-hmm. you would call them like medium markets or secondary or even tertiary markets to those main vacation rental markets. Uh, another market uh, that we're looking in is Crystal Beach, Texas. No one's talking about it. It is still on the Gulf Coast. It's not, you know, the greatest but nevertheless, you can go in there and get something, you know, be tier two or tier three. It's not beachfront, but tier two, tier, tier three for 500, 600 K. Where are you going to get that? Right. Where else are you going to get that? Same thing with Biloxi, Mississippi, and I'm spilling all of my tea. They're going to yeah. come for me. <laughs> We're going to have bidding wars. So these are areas that are secondary and tertiary for sure, but they still have a good uh, travel uh, dynamic. You have uh, the casino, you have the the waterfront and so on and so forth. So but do they I'm have high end properties? I mean, you know, the stuff in the Smokies is not very expensive that I'm aware of. You know, Biloxi, I know that market quite well. I mean, you're you're all about luxury real estate, right? So what kind of price ranges are you talking about in there? Well, definitely when it comes to luxury, again, like I was saying, you have an opportunity to curate that stay and create a brand for yourself. And so what Airbnb is doing now is they're changing their search ability. They're widening it a bit. So the top property within four hours of your property uh, is what's showing up in search for individuals. So if there's a way that you can curate and create a, a stay that is luxurious, you can definitely fit that bill. So I'm always looking for something that has an opportunity for improvement, but can potentially be one of the best in the market. So I was looking at something with a consultant that I work with for revenue. He says mine are the top 99th percentile in price point in all of my markets, because just like with the Poconos, Jason, you'll see some of those homes are kind of old and and it's it's an older home type of community. Mm -hmm. And so you look for an opportunity to, you know, make some renovations, not nothing too crazy, but something that is already turned he would be great. But if there's a, an opportunity to do something special, outdoor fireplace in the backyard, or just to create something that is a, a whole experience, uh, there's definitely opportunity there. So I'm looking for homes that have great bones where I can still come in and not invest too many dollars, but still create an experience that's out of the world for my guests. That's fantastic. Uh, Rachel, what are some of the hardest things that you deal with? What are the big challenges, the areas where people should be prepared for, where people give up. I just hate to people see people give up on things. Usually success is right around the corner from when most people give up, you know, it's so sad. But yeah. you know, just share some of those challenges with us. Yeah, so you mentioned a little bit earlier, Jason, HOA. So we had to sell a home prematurely because there was a quote unquote voluntary HOA, which I hadn't known about um, beforehand, but it was voluntary, but it became very difficult um, operating in that particular community. So voluntary HOAs, non-voluntary HOAs, just be very mindful of what the regulations are. So HOAs, regulations, those types of legal issues, uh, they definitely, definitely can put a damper on your business. And so we, this, this, 
property, which we love, became very problematic because of the the HOA, the president, and everyone was voting against it. And so I totally get that because they wanted it to be a um, an environment where it was just for residents that they knew, they loved, they trusted. And so that became uh, quite a challenge. Another challenge that I see is as someone who's starting uh, a business, and this is a business, uh, you wear all the hats, right? So I was both CEO and cleaning lady simultaneously in the beginning. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. you you want to quickly um, get your systems in place and have a plan to just move, you know, those tasks on to the next individual. Mm -hmm. So yeah. definitely have some type of a system in place, start building out your SOPs because there are others who can do cleaning, make beds, communications even better than you. If you're the owner of the business, the visionary, you're in energy should be spent uh, envisioning what your business looks like and not necessarily making 12 beds. So right. try, try to work on the business, not in the business. But I think the key to what you said there is that you weren't too big a deal to be humble to just get the job done either. Right. Oh, no. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And and some people are, and that's a flaw as well. So yeah, yeah. that's true. Yeah, that's <laughs> Great. Rachel, where can people find you? Sure. Um, and I do have a gift, gift for you, Jason, that, um, and it answers your question as well. The top question that I get asked is where should I invest? And so I worked with a, a few data miners and created a list called 75gyms.com and you'll have access to my top 75 U.S. cities with the highest profitability for 2022. These are the places that I'm scoping out to look to invest myself. And once you grab that list, you'll have access to my little Facebook group where you can join in and see my weekly teachings. So looking forward to connecting. Excellent. Well, Rachel, thank you so much. And we appreciate you sharing. Thank you so much for having me, Jason. What an honor.